Hello, everyone. A very good evening. This is Ekta from the Brenalytics. Uh, we shall be starting in the next two minutes. Just waiting for a few more audience to join. Thank you so much. Hello all, a uh, very good evening. Uh, before I start, I just want to know if I'm audible. Yes, you are audible. How are you? Thank you so much, sir. I'm fine. Thank you for joining. So uh, just a request, there might be a little music on my background or something. A disturbance, please bear with it. Yeah. Yes, Anup, I am audible, right? Yes. Okay. So yes, hello all. You are. Okay, thank you so much. So hello all, a uh, very good afternoon. Myself, Ekta Dubey, and on behalf of the Brenalytics team and our partners, Ecubics and Aviva, we welcome you all on our very interesting roundtable, which is Embracing 4.0 Technology for Power Plant Digitization. So before we start this roundtable, there are a few guidelines that I need to highlight and make our audience aware of. Requesting all the attendees to be on mute when the speakers are taking their session. We will set some guidelines that are, you need to raise your hands, unmute yourself, introduce yourself, and put your question to our speakers. Also, we will keep the chat box very engaging. You can put your questions there, and we would love to take it from there. So to now start, I am happy to introduce our partners, Ecubics. Ecubics, owned by Value Chain Solutions India Private Limited, provides smart solutions for business transformation in the area of manufacturing, supply chain, sales, and infrastructure services. Their digital solutions offer digital enterprise, industrial IoT, data science, and analytics to clients worldwide process efficiency and real-time actionable insights to optimize and transform your business. And to start with, I would like to invite Mr. Kamaldeep Singh, Managing Director with Value Chain Solutions India Private Limited to share his keynote thoughts on the same. Over to you, Mr. Kamaldeep. Thank you for joining. Thank you, Ekta. Maima, thanks can you... for everyone. Yes, sir. Maima, can you please stop sharing the screen so that we can put sir on spotlight? 
Yes, uh, sir. Thanks, What's everyone. You? I think it is post lunch session. So everyone has come out time, uh, have taken out from their busy schedule. So thank you very much for uh, joining this session. See, broadly, uh, let me talk a bit about the company and uh, corporate video can be played by Ekta later on. We are looking at, at uh, Industry 4.0 product and services. That's what we deliver. And we are the leading partner of Aviva. And we have our own uh, solutions also, which we uh, position in the market and happy to serve the customers in, in, in India and abroad. But the idea of connecting people here is that there is a lot of knowledge and wisdom already existing. You are uh, leading professionals in the field, in the power industry, and from a Viva site where ITOT integration comes. And there is a lot of value which uh, comes on the table when we exchange thoughts, when we discuss some ideas. And that is where these sessions were planned. And uh, we, we are thankful to Brain Analytics to partner with us and make sure that industry leaders join and they share their thoughts on certain areas. And that's how there is a learning, uh, continuous learning cycle, which is initiated. And I welcome you all again and hopeful, uh, hopeful to le learn from you and learn. I think there is a lag. Uh, anu? Yeah. Can you hear now? Is it okay? Yes, sir. We can hear you. Yeah, I'm saying you can go ahead and play the video and I welcome all the audience to join. Sure. The I will just play the video. Cubics. We are eCubics, the growth catalyst in your digital transformation journey. Tune to the pulse of the digital future. We drive innovation with the digital technology ecosystem. From a humble beginning in 2006, we have transformed eCubics as one of the top industry 4.0 solution providers. We are now serving clients in 15 plus countries. We are a CMMI level 3 certified company. Serving 100,000 plus users with a strong team of 200 plus technocrats. So far, industry has achieved more than $350 million saving from eCubic's products and services, and the same is still counting. Our presence is in industries like cement, agrochemical, pharmaceutical, pulp and paper, minerals and metals, ports, oil and gas, power. eCubics is organized in four strategic business units, each focusing on different area of an enterprise. Smart factory to improve production process and asset performance. Smart supply chain for better fleet management. Smart channel for brand protection through genealogy and serialization and smart sales for field activity management. eCubex brings global best products to solve industry problems through strategic business partnerships with world leaders like OSI Soft, now Aviva, Seek, Waterfall, Sato, Microsoft, eCubex is your growth catalyst for digital age technologies.
that was the corporate video of eCubics that we shared with you. Now, can I invite Mr. Varun Varma, Asset Performance Management Specialist, APAC from Aviva, to share his insights on the subject. Over to you, Varun, and thank you so much for joining us. Thank you, Ekta, <clears throat> and good morning, good afternoon, good evening from wherever you are joining. Uh, my name is Varun Verma, and I am the Asset Performance Management Specialist in Aviva, looking after the entire Asia-Pacific region. Uh, in my current role, I act as an advisor to asset-intensive organizations like oil and gas and power, and help them set up their digital transformation foundation, uh, focusing more on asset performance. Right? Um, today, I want to talk to you about some of the key trends that we are seeing in the power industry, and also what are the highlights and where uh, major uh, global players are focusing on. So let me start sharing my screen and hopefully you'll be able to see it. Can someone please confirm if you can see my screen and hear me okay? Yes, Varun, your screen is clearly seen. <clears throat> Great, thank you. So let me start off with the state of the industry, right? Um, we are seeing that COVID has really transformed the way we have done business and it highlighted the critical need for reliable and affordable electricity. We have also seen that because of COVID, there's more and more requirement of remote workforce and need for a centralized O&M team, which leverages subject matter knowledge that can be delivered to all the sites and all the plants immediately, right? We are seeing more and more companies committing to sustainability and you know decarbonization. And one way they are doing it is with expansion of renewable energy uh, natural gas and optimizing traditional uh, resources as it is right and we are seeing a lot of mergers and acquisitions that is happening in this space right so i think the way it is right now in 2022 uh, that it is in a positive growth environment uh, all the industry leaders have committed to decarbonization and that is what one of the key themes we are seeing across the industry so if i summarize in three terms the three themes Number one is reduce carbon, right? We are all committed. But when we say reduce carbon, while we focus on renewable energy, it doesn't mean that the traditional power plants will go away. They will stay, but we need to come up with the right balance between the two, right? Uh, at least for the foreseeable future. Digital technology, we have seen that it is very, very important for companies and power plant producers uh, power producers to focus on AI and ML-based technologies that helps them managing their entire operations in a more effective and efficient manner, helping leveraging all the O&M knowledge at, together at one place. And we are seeing that all our industry leaders are focused on availability, reliability, and sustainability. So I thought I'll show you a graph of how we are looking at operational versus planned power plant in terms of renewable energy, right? We are seeing that if you look at it from coal, natural gas, solar, wind, hydro, nuclear, we are seeing that between 2019 to 2021, there has been a substantial growth in all the sectors, but that doesn't mean that coal is going away, right? Like that's what I wanted to show. So coal is going to be there, but of course we are seeing more and more, even if you look at India, we are seeing more and more wind energy, uh, wind power producers coming in and solar power producers coming in and overall you will see substantial. So I think the world today is trying to come to a right balance. And it is very important because while you are driving sustainability, you are also trying to look at it from a profitability perspective. So in the new normal, the World Economic Forum did a survey and they've identified that the digital technology can accelerate your value creation, reduce cost by five to 30% and thereby growing your revenue by up to 25%. This is not our survey, but World Economic Forum. And I think, while right now everybody is under tremendous pressure to produce more and cheaper electricity they want to do that profitably thus reducing cost becomes a key lever and they have identified that they need to be fast and efficient because almost 250 million dollars per year is wasted in labor costs uh, they need to have something that is flexible scalable easily deployed across multiple sites right so that you can respond to the trend, trends the way it is changing and there is a better collaboration between users in terms of everybody looking at it visualizing contextualizing the same data no matter where they are right and they of course cyber security has been a bigger threat and everybody is looking at something that is secure and available 
and more and more cloud security processes are being set up between the business owner and solution provider. So when it comes to the use of industrial software, there are a few things that promote adoption, but there are also some constraints, right? So let me talk about some of them and then we can continue, right? From an adoption perspective, each of our customers have a digital transformation initiative in place, which is focused on advanced analytics, setting up key use cases that they want to go ahead and work on, right? They all have initiatives around place to promote cybersecurity, and they all have focus around remote workforce, connected worker, and having a centralized monitoring and diagnostic center. These are all the things that the industrial software is enabling them to do, and it's great that they are looking at it. But while we do that, our companies are facing a lot of constraints as well, right? Constraint financial revenue on variable generation resources after capital spend, right? Human resources, more with less. Business versus IT discussions, right? Sometimes is it a business project? Is it an IT project? Confusing messages around big data, AI and ML is kind of uh, spreading across the market, which sometimes confuses our decision makers. But the good thing is, you have to look at this as an opportunity. We are all evolving. Technology is evolving at a super fast pace. And while these constraints are there, I genuinely believe each company needs to come out with their own objectives. Digital transformation needs to be driven from top needs to understand why we are doing it. It should not be done for the sake of an IT project, but it should be trying to solve a business value uh, and focused more around that, right? So I thought I would show you some digital transformation trends in power industry, right? Uh, Capgemini actually surveyed 200 senior executives from the global utility com companies and found that they expect productivity improvements from digital technologies to increase to 27% in the next five years compared to 21 percent in the past 25 years that's the pace with which uh, transformation is happening right technology is changing impact is happening and i've highlighted for you some of the trends in the power industry that we are seeing right operation analytics process automation predictive and prescriptive maintenance 40 percent is a priority Human 2.0, right connected worker robots smart glasses exoskeleton while you think of smart electricity and smart grid it needs to be operated by the human part of it and you have to ensure that you give them efficiency around that right digital industrial asset life cycle management again a key value trend that all the industry leading senior executives are looking at and i want to ask you are you looking at these trends are these some of the trends that your management is looking at it and if it is or if there's something more we love to hear from you but if it is you need to prioritize which trends or which of these priorities you need to work on and work from there to understand your business use case before you define your IT strategy for it, right? So in my opinion, the next energy rep revolution is here and the opportunity for power is huge. There's an insight and a decision support system through a big data analytics. Data is huge. People say data is the new oil. We have to balance traditional and renewable energy resources. We cannot be tipping towards one end completely while forgetting about the other. We need to have the rational uh, balance between the then. Streamline innovation, yes. Reduce the total cost of ownership. And I'm not talking ownership only from an IT perspective, but I'm talking about overall operations perspective. You need, you need, you absolutely need to predict your asset failure because like World Economic Forum told you, that there is tremendous pressure to reduce costs by 5 to 25% using digital initiatives. And the only way you do that is having sustainable productions where you have a clear line of sight of what you're producing, how you're producing, and wherever the failures are happening, you are able to predict and detect it before it happens. Mitigate workforce turnover, improve safety, and maximizing your return on asset investment. Right. So, let me talk to you quickly about some of the customers who have done this very, very successfully. One of them is NL, right? NL is one of the biggest power producers uh, in Europe. They are overall having 23 gigawatt of power. And when the pandemic forced their team to work from home, they wanted to have a sustainable delivery and they still wanted to ensure that the critical services are continued. So that's when they started looking at predictive analytics as part of asset performance management. And they work with Aviva to have a 100% remote operational management of their renewal assets. 
they were able to detect 220 plus events before the failure actually happened, saving them a lot of cost, a lot of money, and having sustainable production to be provided to their end customers. So here is one customer who has really transformed themselves taking advantage of the big data, artificial intelligence, machine learning, and all the key themes that I spoke to you about, they have been truly been able to replicate that in the business. Another is EDF, again, a huge power producer globally. They are using uh, a condition-based maintenance on the Aviva Pi system, as well as our predictive analytic system, which is helping them to get operational intelligence to build systems to take data into actionable information. And the beauty is, it is not only about compliance, right? Look at it. 1.5 million pounds, uh, euros, is saved in a single early warning catch. So value is absolutely real. The avoided cost can have massive implications. It is not only related to uh, wind uh, or, you know, uh, nuclear or even thermal. Look at solar. Solar, there's so much opportunity to do. And here is a customer called Sener who has set up a centralized you know, control platform and integrated all their systems together. They are providing clean energy to 120,000 homes. They have applied predictive analytics from Aviva to optimize their performance and having better working and maintenance uh, uh, through remote supervision. So I think if you look at it in summary, all these customers, what they're doing, and if you look at the themes of trends in the power industry, I like to narrow it down to five things. You need to have a connected asset strategy, like all your equipments needs to be uh, connected, right? Then there's connected uh, maintenance strategy, when you should do repair versus when you should do replacement, right? You need to have a connected content strategy. There's so much content uh, in the industry from OEMs, something about data that you're building in together. You need to be able to operationalize all of that. Connected worker where your worker needs to have information right at the fingertip as and when required, and everybody is visualizing, contextualizing the same data. And connected visualization, bringing it all together into a single pane of glass, single source of truth, so that you completely have the same view of how your performance is going. So these are some of the trends that I wanted to present to you. And I wanted to tell you, if you work on these trends, the question is not about our planet or profits. The beauty is, or is gone. You can focus on your planet as well as your profit when you look at digital transformation trends, focusing on the themes and driving value for yourself, your shareholders, and for your end users. With that, I would like to thank you for your time and I would see if there are any questions. Thank you so much, Varun, for sharing your insights. Uh, do we have any questions for Varun audiences? Uh, yeah, hi. Am I audible? Yes, please introduce yourself and put your question. Thank you. Yeah, uh, myself, Devang Anadkat. And uh, I think one question, Varun, regarding onboarding a new assets, how much it will be take a time for onboarding a new assets and, uh, and uh, to give the predictive analysis for that new assets like RUL or uh, maybe we can say the uh, failure, right? Or a root cause analysis after failure, yeah. Right, great, thank, thank you. you. Thank you for the question. Uh, look, um, today the technology is evolving so fast that it is going to be criminal if I tell you that you have to wait one week or two weeks to onboard an equipment in your predictive analytics journey or strategy. Today, you need to be able to do everything in a fast and efficient manner. So in our experience, uh, a predictive model or predictive modeling for an equipment can be done in two hours. And when you do that, the key is having the right setup of sensors available versus the kind of failure modes that you're identifying. Now, the thing is, depends on what is the asset that you're selecting, right? The system nowadays have the capability to give you the remaining useful life, the failure predictions, the failure mode detection, the next steps actions that you need to do. But I think there is some groundwork required at the end user's end because everything that I'm talking to you about is based on, let's say, data availability or sensor availability, right? So if you have the right sensors in place, I can go on a limb and tell you that the detection, the prediction, the accuracy, everything is going to be to the point. But you have less sensors available. Of course, you can go ahead and do the predictions, right? But I think the accuracy will mature as the time progresses. So I generally like to tell my customers that we don't need 
five years data or three years data to do predictive monitoring. The metric monitoring can start with three months of your historical data to learn the behavior and then onboard it in two, two and a half hours and start rolling it. So I hope that answers your question. Yeah, uh, thanks, Varun. So, but it, it belongs to when you having a model is ready with you, right, for the assets. No, I'm talking from scratch. Okay, from scratch. Okay. I'm talking from scratch. I'm assuming that there is no model ready. I'm assuming that because if a model is ready and you just have to plug and play, and then yeah, then even two and a half hours is too much, right? I'm but assuming that you bring all the. Yeah. But we don't have all the fault signature, right? So that was the point that how we can. Yeah. No, no, but but then that's where the difference comes between different vendors who do this, right? And I can talk about Aviva. So when Aviva does a failure prediction, we are not trying to do a prediction of your next failure based on your past failure signature. We actually mm -hmm. remove that from the calculation. When we do a failure prediction, we are trying to actually understand what is the signature of your equipment in a normal running condition. So. We are trying to understand what is the normal so that we can understand the abnormal. We are not trying to do, okay, last time this bearing failure happened, this was the change in vibration and I captured that and I compared that failure signature to the next failure signature to see is there a match. So I think it's an ideology thing, different vendors do it differently. From our side, we are today monitoring 550,000 megawatt of power assets and what we have seen is our approach is sustainable because we are not dependent on a past failure because failures are random. You cannot have experienced all the failure patterns up front, right? So that's the whole idea about it. Yeah. Thanks, Varun. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So, Varun, Thank you, Varun, for Raji answer. Sharaf here from Torrent Power. I have a yes. small question which is Please correlated go. to my previous question. See, the, you are taking three months data and then within two hours, uh, the system starts working. So what is the prediction accuracy of the failure? Great. So uh, are we getting 50%, 60% or more than this? Because that's more important because our business will depend upon this provided accuracy is better. Right. They say it is waste of my resources. See, I will tell you, uh, I think we are looking at it again a bit differently. Uh, what my so our solution first of all comes up with something called a uh, prediction confidence factor okay so when we come up with a confidence factor we say is it urgent 70 percent confidence 60 percent confidence in our prediction we give all of that right but the idea is slightly different the predictions and forget aviva right i'm talking about whole as a concept right the predictions will always be accurate if you have the right data coming in right because the again, I am not saying replace everything else you are doing. This is supposed to be an investigation tool, analytical tool on top of your current maintenance practices. And you don't even need to monitor all 100% of your assets on a technology like predictive analytics, right? Because you want to monitor only your critical or production critical assets, not a low, medium or low critical asset. Right? So what happens is if you have more sensors, right? then sensors are going to go ahead and give you enough data that the accuracy of the alert will also go up. That's the reality. The, now, this is a chicken and egg situation, right? Do you first invest in sensors or do you first invest in the program? The answer is you always invest in the program first with whatever you have today. And what that will do is that will identify the gaps for you where you need to eventually deploy some sensors. Because sensor deployment is a never ending project. Every year, some new sensor will come in and you will continue doing it. But the idea is getting the maximum return from your existing deployment, existing investments that you've already done. So deploy a predictive analytics program. Maybe the accuracy is 70%, maybe the accuracy is 80%, but that is good enough to help you identify what the gaps are in your end, which you need to work on. Instead of going through from a blind eye perspective, you know, I need to focus on this 10, 15%. And that's how you mature the program over time. So I, I hope that answers. Okay, thanks. 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 Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Parun, uh, actually, we have one more question, but uh, respecting the time, what I would suggest is if you can answer to that on the chat box, chat. You know, even the audience will view that. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks. <laughs> Thank you, Varun. So now moving on to the another, I would like to invite uh, Mr. Naveen Solanki to share his insights on the subject. Over to you, Mr. Nawin Solang. Thank you for joining. Yeah. Is it audible, Hector? 
Yes, you are. Yes. Okay. Yes, Naveen, audible. Yeah. Okay. Hi, this is Naveen, working as a pre-sales consultant uh, in Aviva, with around close to 15 years experience. Uh, and as a as a consultant, my key role is in ass assisting uh, Aviva clients in max maximizing the business value that they can extract from the use of Aviva IPM solutions. Uh, by the real industry experience, be it uh, the people's, uh, my disconnected worker, which Varun has already talked about, the process part of it, and the technology, which is the Aviva Predictive Analytics. Just sharing my screen. Yes, Mr. Nave. Is it is it visible? The screen is. No, uh, not now. Yes, now we can see. And it's the first slide deck. Yeah, that talks about embracing 4.2. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So just uh, briefly touch up on uh, from the Varun has left the, the advent and the usage of digitalization in a power plant. So if you see uh, for any uh, power plant asset, there are two modes of uh, equipment maintenance. One could be the under maintenance in which, uh, let me, Yeah, the first is the uh, under maintenance in which uh, there is uh, two costs associated to it. One is because of the uh, non-availability of that asset, that uh, the downtime or the non-production loss of it. And then uh, the uh, outage or because of which the uh, the planned or the forced outages which are happening for that asset. And the second is the uh, over, uh, over maintenance regime in which the preventive cost or the scheduled based maintenance are there and the, this cost is high vis-a-vis -vis the cost of non-availability or the production loss or the breakdown is less. So uh, with the Aveva APM solutions, we are trying to achieve an optimum balance between both the modes of regime and have an, uh, you can say, by reducing the downtime, providing the, uh, providing the asset failures, reducing the maintenance cost, in a way, uh, helping to actually have the more uh, asset availability and reliability. So uh, this is a study done by the ARC advisory group in which in, it indicates there are around 82% failures are random failures. Uh, around 18% are actually age-related failures, which are because of the wear and tear of that asset or uh, end of life of that asset. And for those 18%, we have the um, maintenance strategies, which are reactive maintenance or preventive maintenance, like, like uh, you can say uh, calendar-based or time-based maintenance are there to address those 18% failures. When we talk about those 82% failures, which are random failures, we need more matured maintenance strategies like a condition-based maintenance, more of a predictive and prescriptive maintenance. So this is a layered approach in which any organization goes from maybe from condition-based maintenance to predictive and prescriptive maintenance, and then the uh, risk-based maintenance. And uh, as since uh, most of the participants are already Aviva uh, users, so uh, you can say uh, from uh, the condition-based or the matured maintenance strategy, how uh, Aviva predictive analytics can act as a natural integration and we can focus more towards the predictive or a time-based maintenance or a proactive maintenance for the assets which are, uh, are operating at your fleet. So uh, talking uh, briefly about, uh, about the Aviva predictive analytics. So it is the uh, anomaly detection for your business critical assets, which are uh, actually focusing more on the plant uptime or uh, the plant availability issues. And it, it has the complete, you can see the all the features and functionalities to touch upon the various aspects of it, be it the alert management, be it the fault diagnostics, or even the uh, transient analysis, which are uh, the analysis of the short-lived phenomena which are happening for a power plant asset. For example, like a turbine startup or a turbine startups. So these are the rare phenomena which are happening and needs a more deep dive analysis because most of the problem starts to uh, inherent at this stage itself. And then uh, coming on to the prescriptive analytics, which is more of giving the prescriptive advices to your operators, to your engineers, to what all actions to be taken for any alert or an anomaly which is getting di diagnosed from the uh, predictive analytic system. And uh, with uh, like uh, operationalizing predictive analytics at a scale better than anyone because we have uh, the ready-made you can see uh, uh, tools and the templates available to deploy uh, the uh, predictive analytics model at a scale uh, than anyone else so just an uh, illustration uh, like a typical monitoring for any of the dcs or a skydata trend you see uh, for any uh, 
pump or a, or a fan or a turbine this is uh, like a, a associated parameters are behaving as per the loading conditions as per the operating conditions or as per the uh, the different loads which are there so uh, there is a correlation among each and every parameters with the load the parameters are increasing and decreasing and there is uh, an inherent uh, correlations which is uh, not possible to be decoded uh, by best of the uh, dcs or the best of the possible so that's why the uh, statistical methods or the machine learning methods can actually tell you whether uh, the mode of operation at this point of time is the you can say the most optimized uh, operation or a further scope is there uh, to uh, enhance the uh, you can say the operation at this point so just a representation how the uh, the different sensors are behaving for a typical assets and uh, this uh, this is a standard uh, you can see the difference between the traditional monitoring or the predictive asset monitoring uh, on the left hand side you see uh, this is the uh, normal you can say a temperature bearing temperature or a, you can say a fan bearing temperature trend with respect to time and you can see uh, red is the dcs or the oem recommended high high alarm limit the parameters uh, you can say is clearly uh, behaving under the you can say the set set thresholds by the oem and a human eye cannot make a deviation or cannot identify whether any uh, abnormality or any uh, deviation is there from the data set vis-a-vis -vis, if you do a, you can say a predictive asset analytics using the machine learning models there is an uh, another sensor which is coming in picture which is the estimated signal or or a predicted signal which is uh, coming from the you can see the past operating behavior of that asset and uh, as already mentioned we don't require any fault signatures or failure signatures for your assets to uh, generate this predicted signal we just need around maybe four to six months of good operating history or the operational signature and this estimated signal is generated from that uh, historical data and from this point onwards you can clearly see the normal bearing temperature is deviating from the expected behavior and uh, there are two things available uh, first is the luxury of information the engineers are able to uh, know that there is an deviation which is happening uh, which is starting from this point onwards and then there is a luxury of time you can see uh, there is a time to act upon this anomaly so the information is there that there is an issue and also the time is there to act on this because these are the uh, early warning alerts and there are maybe days and weeks to act on these uh, early warnings coming to the the ba basic functionalities uh, of the uh, anomaly detection so it has uh, you can see the uh, overall uh, an overall model residual which we call as the omr as the health indicator of the model so this is the best in class because an anomaly is detected we are uh, closing the complete loop of it from where what is the problem where the problem has started and what are the signal contributors what is the expected failure mode for that and the complete prescriptive actions for that and also now we have an added feature which is the forecast features in which we can you can actually do a prediction and say whether the uh, equipment is going to fail in the next week or next days so as to have a more you can say scientific uh, you can say analogy to to your confidence yes this is a deviation and i can continue operating my asset under this set of regime so uh, this is a typical representation in which uh, you see uh, the first chart is the overall overall you can see the uh, health indicator of the model and uh, if any deviation in there from their operating or the expected behavior there will be a deviation in the omr and we don't uh, with the deviation in omr we, the second trend shows the signals which are causing that deviation to happen with that signal deviation we can always go on the left hand side and see which, which all sensors are causing that deviation to happen whether it's the bearing temperature or the bearing vibration or it's the flow or suction filter so uh, accordingly what is the anomaly uh, we can go and see the various signals and what is the expected value the predicted value and what is the actual value of that and also the the failure mode of it uh, what is the likely failure or what is the likely fault for that issue to happen no so now up till now we know what is the issue and where is the issue now what is to be done and what all next steps should be taken is also coming as a loop closer as already talked upon so 
for each and every fault we have the complete uh, you can say the prescriptive guidance or the prescriptive library built in in which we tell whether the uh, what could be the mttr what whether the equipment is uh, is is downtime required or not and also the next steps so next steps generally are the tacit oem informations like a oem troubleshooting guideline or it could be a standard sop for uh, each and every uh, customer or each and every participant like this is uh, in these scenarios i'll be taking these steps for any anomaly which is happening for my asset so this is uh, almost 80 to 90% is readily built in and can be customized subject to your oem subject to your uh, standard procedures uh, which are there at as at your plant so uh, for a, for an early warning for an uh, typical alert which is uh, generated from the predictive analytic systems so this is the standard uh, you can say the uh, flow of the information from from the alert list or from the dashboard which is an early warning dashboards we get a, you can say the uh, the priority alerts only on which some actions are required and this is customizable this could be your unit specific this could be your subject matter specific like a, a pump expert wants to see only pump level alerts or a turbine expert wants to see only turbine alerts so those customization can be done and this dash dashboard is specific focusing on the priorities because these are early warning alerts and there is a time to act upon basis those alert there is a, you can say a sensor preprocessing conditions in which the uh, noises or the alerts mainly because of the sensors bad uh, flat, flat lining out high out of range or either they are bad or not updating so those gets eliminated at the first instance once you know uh, there is an alert then you can always call upon the, the various fault diagnostic features and get to see and drill down in in a tree form what could be the likely uh, failure or the fault which is happening for that asset for that fault what could be the next prescriptive guidance and as already uh, talked about it could be customized and it's all readily built in it's uh, coming from iso 14224 we have a standard asset strategy library which for a typical power plant assets uh, I, i'll share you the list in the in the subsequent slides so it completes the complete inspections to be done the complete root cause analysis and what all is to be done for each and every fault is already built in and then the forecasting uh, you can say uh, ad hoc analysis which which tells you with a with a certain degree of confidence whether uh, the severity is high low medium shall i continue operating the asset under the current scenario or should i plan for an uh, shutdown immediately so all this is coming and it's it's is part of part of a package to have a more you can say informed decision making so that the um, complete uh, downtime of that asset can be avoided so this is the dashboard and uh, uh, as, as per my screen this is uh, as per uh, the industry but this can be again as per your requirement it could be unit specific you could it could be asset specific or it could be uh, as per the requirement of the customer this can be customized this is a fault screen a sample screen i'm just showing uh, in which uh, what all could be the various failure modes for that and what is the you can say the certain degree of you can say certainty like 90% is the average match for this line this is the likely failure which is going to happen for this uh, case in question so this is an in the representation of a uh, fault tree how the the different faults and the likelihood of that fault which is there coming to the prescriptive action so uh, as i already told like these are coming in the four different categories uh, first could be the operational in which the gui the guidance could be coming like you can reduce the load of that asset or maybe uh, reduce the uh, load of that e equipment or take a partial shutdown of that asset this is more of an operational tuning which is could be done to minimize or contain that damage second could be more related to the inspection third is more of an uh, maintenance and this maintenance is again as uh, could be as per oem recommendation and could be as per the requirement of that uh, anomaly which is happening and third uh, the fourth being the root cause analysis in which the actual root cause analysis is done and basically telling uh, by the offline validation and also the you can say the offline uh, you can say the field validation by the engineers and the supervisors which requires some kind of uh, you can say offline measurements whether the uh, problem or the anomaly is really is there or shall we continue operating it so this is all coming uh, as a inbuilt in the solution itself this is the re uh, remaining useful life estimate or the forecast feature in which we gives you a confidence level whether the uh, 
uh, uh, the anomaly which is there, whether it's a uh, priority is low, moderate, or high. And if it is very high, you can immediately plan the shutdown for that uh, uh, anomaly which is happening for your pump, fan, or even bearing. But whatever is the anomaly, the, those actions could be planned. And it's all coming uh, with the statistical as well as the deep learning algorithms are there, which are running behind this uh, forecasting alert. Coming to the descriptive library, so this uh, as a uh, already built in, and uh, this is uh, again coming from ISO 14224. Uh, we have close to around thousand components, so we call pump as one component and even fan and another components. So this uh, asset strategy library is built for around thousand components. For those thousand components, we have close to fifteen hundred failure modes or the typical uh, failure modes that could happen for that asset. Close to two thousand preventative tasks and for those preventive tasks, what could be the prescriptive task as, as these uh, 5,000 prescriptive tasks are there, like uh, what all could be the next steps or the prescriptions for uh, avoiding that failure to happen. And all this is coming with the two decades of experience. Uh, this uh, solution is, is in use for close to two decades and uh, around 550 gigawatt across the globe uh, uh, are using this tool as, as an early warning or an anomaly detection tool. Uh, coming to a, a part of connected strategies, since you know that there is an issue, there are, uh, you can say, uh, there is a background noise. So uh, how do you plan and optimize your maintenance strategy? I assume uh, the model is indicating there is no anomaly for that pump. So maybe you can defer the planned or the, uh, you can say time-based maintenance, which is there. Uh, just to quote an example, assume you're cleaning or replacing your uh, lube oil filters every three months or four months. And if the model is indicating that there is no anomaly, maybe you can defer that uh, filter cleaning or filter replacement maybe another next month. So in a way, uh, in a year, if you're doing maybe four cycles of the filter cleaning, now you can do it maybe uh, three cycles or three and a half cycles subject to the, uh, the anomalies or the alerts. This is again the risk-based or informed decision we are taking from the predicted model, which is which is already running in the background of the system. So it's more about uh, proactive maintenance uh, towards the moving the proactive maintenance and optimizing the uh, maintenance st strategy. Connected worker is again, how do you digitally enable your workforce? Uh, all these anomalies or the uh, actual, you can say, alerts can be uh, directly transferred to your plant operators. From there, they can actually we see and visualize what all are the anomalies, what, what is the probable failure mode for that. In a way, they are more informed in the process and taking actions right at the shop floor so that the uh, execution as well as the preparation is already, uh, the time behind that is getting avoided. Uh, this is a dashboard uh, for the, uh, you can say the, uh, the predictive uh, asset analytic systems in which the, the different stages or the different, you can say the modules which are there uh, and at a snapshot level can be seen, uh, seen like what are the projects, what are the models in alert, how many cases are there and how many sensors, like how many are flatlining and all. So just uh, in the interest of time, just uh, going through what all is uh, available as a ready-made solution and this is purpose built out of the box solutions specifically for the power plant equipments. So as uh, the complete uh, loop closure is happening for, from the uh, early warning initiation till it's the, the complete closure of it. The collaboration and the knowledge transformer, like uh, the uh, we can do uh, back and forth from a centralized place. What and you can always refer these uh, cases or the early warnings to your subject matter experts, and their tacit knowledge and information can be coded and kept as a knowledge repository in the system itself. This uh, the broadly we can divide uh, devise the uh, predictive analytic systems into six key buckets. And uh, the main focus will be on the optimizing the availability and the productions and optimizing the asset maintenance strategy in a way, maintaining the uh, equipment uptime and reducing the un unscheduled downtime for that asset. So uh, just uh, referring to a few of the use cases, what all could be done for a typical boiler uh, across the various sections and the pressure parts of it. The complete, uh, you can say, the uh, assets uh, from for a boiler are can be modeled and anomalies, if any, can be identified in time. 
this is specifically for the boiler tube leakages and uh, the short term overheatings and the long term overheatings uh, if subject to the metal temperatures available we can do the predictive modeling for that and avoid those uh, uh, overheating uh, issues for a, for a boiler and there are uh, use use cases of, of, of the predictive analytic solutions for the boiler fouling cases as well the models were able to tell in time yeah there is a suspected boiler fouling and then you can always plan for your uh, maintenance uh, or or the downtime uh, in time for that uh, boiler this is just an overview for the uh, steam and water cycle the from the hp heaters to lp heaters the steam turbine hp ip turbine and all what all is is can be envisaged this is for an hrsg the heat rate uh, heat uh, recovery steam generator this is for a wind turbine and the, the various subsections of a wtg what all uh, failure modes or the faults which could be done using a wave predictive analytic solution again some of the use cases for for the solar pv this is for a csp we as already explained by varun so we have a install base across the csp as well in which the sub, uh, different sections of a, of a csp plant are modeled and are using a predictive analytics for the uh, anomaly detection and so this these are the few of the uh, you can see the customer success or the customer references uh, as of now we are uh, close to uh, 50000 industrial assets are using uh, monitoring uh, the Aviva predictive analytic solution. And if you see, uh, these are the six key uh, large uh, customers in gigawatt scale. And they all are using uh, their fleet, whether it's coal, thermal, nuclear, hydro, wind. So it's, it's a mix of, uh, we are completely vendor agnostics. Be it any OEM, the solution can be applied on, 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 on the existing OEMs and the predictive and uh, modeling can be done. And these are the uh, typical asset list for which uh, the, these are the power generation assets for the for which the uh, predictive analytics can be implemented or is implemented. Uh, this is already covered by Varun. So I'm just uh, touching upon one of the use cases which we have in India is Tata Power. So they have uh, the Aviva predictive analytics implementation uh, for, for a close to six gigawatt and uh, in, in at a scale of around more than 1,000 predictive uh, models in, in running in condition. It's been around uh, seven to eight years now. So in the initial years of operation, they have more than 60 smart catches or the actual, uh, you can say the true positive cases from the uh, uh, implementation of the systems and the associated savings out of it. So uh, in, in, a, in a nutshell, so, Aveva APM is the market recognition and we have the complete, we are the industry leaders for close to three years now, uh, continuously. And the product is uh, the complete AI based and uh, predictive analytics uh, at a scale. We have a proven scalability because most of the references are at, at a gigawatt scale. And it's it's a natural in, uh, integration to the Pi system. So there are native, native uh, Pi AF connectors, which are available, the complete asset hierarchy, which is there in Pi, can be integrated in the Aviva predictive analytics. So that will be all. Any questions? Thank you so much, Mr. Naveen, for sharing your yeah. insights. So much, uh, of course, uh, the questions can be addressed in the chat box, respecting the time. So uh, may I move ahead and introduce our panel? The topic that again talk about uh, embracing 4.0 technology for power plant digitization. First, I'd like to introduce our speakers for the day. We have Mr. Manu Sharma, Deputy General Manager, PSCS Yamuna Power Limited, Mr. Alexander Naidu, Global Head, SCADA and Visualization with Suzlon Energy Limited, Mr. Sunil Meher, Head Supply Chain Management, Solar International, Sterling and Wilson Renewable Energy Limited. Mr. Rajiv Shah, Head IT with Torrent Power, Mr. Anand Kumar Tripathi, Director of Power Plant and Projects Gulf Division, European Union Resin, Hyundai Heavy Industries Power System. Mr. Alok Mukherjee, he's a subject matter expert on the power generation. Of course, we have Anup Garf, uh, who handles the Marcom at Value Chain Solutions and the team from Value Chain Solutions who would be there on the panel. So now 
First, can I invite uh, the thoughts of Mr. Alexander Naidu on embracing 4.0 in digitization when we talk about power plant? Yeah, thank you very much, Ekta, for um, letting us speak on this uh, forum. It is quite impressive to see uh, the agenda set across on uh, 4.0. Yes, uh, we have seen the trend of uh, wind portfolio uh, in terms of not only wind, in terms of renewable. There are quite a bit changes that are coming in terms of digitalization, digitization. But uh, I still see a lot of gap in terms of uh, clear understanding on the topic of digitalization as such, which needs more better clarity and understanding amongst uh, all the renewable fraternity. Yeah, there are products that are available which could be uh, beneficial uh, in terms of ONM operational activities, but uh, there is uh, still far more to go ahead in terms of better understanding on technology as such as a product which could cater not only to the renewable assets at the uh, site or at the wind farm level, but also need to be uh, looking in the perspective of the regulatory. Uh, quite a bit of missing gaps in terms of regulatory, uh, which is today in India stepped up quite big in terms of integrating all the uh, renewable sector. Having said this, yes, we have uh, a very uh, major big target that is set across us uh, touching upon to 500 gigawatt to be established. There's a huge gap, but then it's not only that we keep installing these devices, but uh, we also need to think on the digital kind of product that needs to be really delivering on uh, the field. Um, very importantly, uh, we have seen companies which have been working towards uh, digital product in terms of not only on the operational side, but also needs to be worked around on the regulatory as well as on the technology front. More important, it was very good to hear that from Varun that uh, yes, there are systems that are already in place in terms of uh, deliverables for the field technician, which is very important and uh, needs to be more focused. But my question still lies, uh, having said this on predictive and uh, perspective analytics, do we still need to work around on the conditioning-based monitoring system if the accuracy level is much more advanced and better than as delivered by Aviva, then I think uh, we don't need to think about on the conditioning-based monitoring system rather than having the uh, better accuracy onto the models that have been already built in house would benefit a lot of the organization today, uh, be it the wind, solar, hydro, or thermal. That could be more helpful in order to model in order to have a better asset monitoring. So I think it's a good step, good initiation in terms of uh, digital product, uh, but we uh, still are seeking or rather looking in for one single product, which can be a decision-making tool, which could cater both the field as well as the central. So ideally talking, uh, we need a better asset monitoring system which could integrate all these equipments, not only related to the physical assets in terms of uh, wind turbine or solar, but also the uh, grid infrastructure. The other assets which are uh, catering to those deliverables also needs to be monitored, operated, and uh, better managed and more benefiting at the field technician level. So I would support more towards the field uh, than talking more on the central side because central can be well uh, placed in terms of uh, integrating and having one of the best system that we can have in the world. But when it comes into the field, uh, we still have a huge gap, which needs to be seriously addressed by uh, many of the key important uh, members, stakeholders here today who are present, have to be working towards at the site level. If you see they are, uh, the integrating of assets itself within the wind farm, it's got a major, major gap. We talk about uh, a system which has uh, still not been in a position to 100% have integrated at the wind farm. But then we are talking more on the central side and making digital platform as much as we want. And we are also talking about the accuracy level of the results when we don't have those data coming to the central level. Yes, it's good to know that we have big data, we have uh, analytics, we have a lot of other uh, systems, 
but then main is a source that needs to be uh, dragged towards the central area. So I think we need to work a lot on the communication front. We need to talk more on the network. And third, very important is cybersecurity, which is a very big uh, gap today and needs to be seriously focused on uh, to uh, secure our assets at the wind farm. Not only at the wind farm, wherever your assets have been spread in, I think needs to be very stringently um, worked upon and integrated well, right? Um, because of the cost economics, yes, many people have been compromising on those setups that have been established. But on the serious note, I honestly would rather request all the key stakeholders to work around on this, to have the better asset monitoring and uh, have a good, better decision-making tool on the digital platform that has been already been designed and readily available of the market. Thank you so much, sir. And uh, of course, special thank you because I know your throat is not well and yeah. still you made it. I really appreciate it. Thank you so much, sir. So much. Now, uh, can I invite thoughts of uh, Mr. Rajiv Straff, Head IT with Torrent Power on Civil Alliance. Over to you, sir. And thank you once again. Hi, good afternoon and good evening. So I think uh, this is the right uh, forum and uh, to start the discussion of Industry 4.0 because uh, last couple of years, there has been a lot of discussion on digital transformation, where it was more on the IT point of view, where we were talking of uh, how, how do we enable the processes? How do we try to ensure that customer service, the workforce, decision making and everything can be enabled using the data, using the cloud, using the analytics and all that. And now uh, the trend is moving toward industry four. It is just, just at the tipping point starting because that also is going to be a journey. It is not, a, you know, kind of, a, uh, you know, small pieces put together and then you we say that uh, it's completed because uh, IT and OT integration itself is, is an important aspect where, where one has to look at it. How do we standardize the data? How do we ensure that interpretation of data across the things is good because analytics part is covered under the IT. Whereas uh, the data coming and all this thing is part of the OT. So we have to ensure that OT IT integration is done properly. Second thing, once we do IT and OT integration, uh, as uh, Mr. Alexander rightly said, the security concerns are increasing because IT users are typically IT users. And then along with that, the security threat comes. And uh, if that threat goes into the OT network, uh, the ramification, the impact, to everything is humongous and uh, we have to look at those aspects how do we do it because asset surface uh, whatever we call it uh, for the security is very important knowing the asset surface how many assets are there where are they how they are what is their current posture everything is need to be known and once we start moving toward iot the asset surface is going to increase and ensuring that <coughs> all the assets are maintained properly and uh, you know it is hygiene then uh, we will have the effective benefit of this. So these are the important aspects when we put up the strategy part of it. How are we going to leverage IoT 4? And uh, uh, the benefits, as we rightly mentioned, uh, the, and uh, was known in this discussion that uh, uh, we don't require the history data because many of the OT system do not have historian, data historian, or, or even if they have kept the data historian, somewhere it, the data is not available in a required format. So if even if the data historian is not available and if uh, we can start with the month of the data and then start uh, doing the prediction uh, with even 60%, 70% accuracy, it's really, really good, good achievement in terms of analytics. Because earlier it is in IT, we used to say more the data, more the history, better the accuracy. But here, I think ML and the technology advancement has given us uh, the benefit that um, we don't need to depend upon the history. We can leverage very minimum um, uh, age of the data and then start uh, predicting the behavior and then deciding or providing decision support system to the OT staff. So enormous benefit of this. Uh, but, but I think as an organization, we all need to identify what are the principles or the goals which we are going to achieve is it that asset optimization is it that cost reduction 
is, is it that uh, delivery of the better products or new products because of the data, whatever I'm going to get, can I generate uh, some additional models and then try to provide a new services or new products uh, to my business top of line and then input my bottom line and ultimately, uh, you know, we, uh, the, the, the model itself pay back and then you go on investing into it. So I think that's, that's something from my side. Thank you. Thank you so much, Raji. Um, Mr. Anup, any thoughts on similar lines? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, I, I just want to uh, tell uh, very, very nicely brought out that what exactly do we desire from this uh, asset optimization? So just to answer you from as a as a uh, product side, and uh, I, I'm trying to promote our product to you. So the first thing which we would like to talk to you is the efficiency which you create on the monetary front, okay? And the second thing which is, uh, uh, which comes uh, as, a, as a precursor to that is the comfort with which you are able to, you know, do your duties. Because see, power industry as such is a very, very highly demanding industry. And some kind of uh, help in this industry uh, would really uh, go along with in uh, making all of our lives easier and the country's growth is at stake yes. with the, you know, with yeah, the yeah. industry. Thank you. True. Yeah, thanks. Thank you so much. Uh, now, can I invite Mr. Sunil Meher, head of CM with Solar International with Sterling and Wilson Renewable Energy to share his thoughts, please. Thank you, Mr. Sunil. So you are mute. Yeah, thanks, Ekta. And good evening, everyone. Yes. Yeah, really, the power plant digitization is a nowadays really growing this one. And really, as far as my field is concerned for renewable from solar, is technically contributing the, uh, in the basic area of flexibility, many enhancing sector efficiencies and reduction in the manpower as well. But as far as, and one of the good things is with power plant digitization, the smart grid. Then that is the result of digitization of the, is work of the traditional electric power system to facilitate the integration of renewable energy sources. And that is one of the good thing it has happened in the solar power industry. But as far as there are still, it is to be worked. As Mr. Varun says that they have given a lot of examples of various uh, power developers, but I have not seen any examples of the EPC players. Since I am from the EPC player background, currently which we are working with Sterling. So it is basically it requires a lot of things because it is not a wind power, Solar power comes up, there are many components there the system, and when you come to the ground level to handle it upon, to digitize the, all each and every the problems which comes under after they can the commissioning, testing, and handing over of the plant, it is very, really difficult to control. Though you are having the control room, you have the SADA, you have many things to control, but as far as the ground reality is concerned, there are need to work upon that, how they are going to control it. We are more easy to say, yes, we have many sensors, we have control room, we can do it many things upon this to control the activities of the plant. But as far as the attention on the getting the flower plant coming back to the positions after the breakdown, then it is very difficult for us because we know that we know the ground reality. We can do much more on it, but really I would like to visit on those two or on what have been shared, uh, even there if you on this. And Really, it is to be done in the that level of organization to up to that to optimal optimize the level of the can effort as well as the can cost effect to the all industry as well as the in the interest of the can the power projects. It is much required this power organization. Thank you. Thank you, sir, for sharing your insights. Uh, now, I would like to invite the thoughts of Mr. Anand Kumar Tripathi. Director of Power uh, Plant and Projects Division Gulf with European Union Regions Hyundai Heavy Industries Power System. Mr. Anand, please share your thoughts on the similar lines. Hi, good afternoon, everyone. In India, it is here uh, today. I am at Copenhagen, and uh, uh, we are looking at uh, so many projects in the Gulf and European Union regions. And currently, we are making around uh, 9,800 megawatt uh, Gulf and uh, Europe region. 
we are basically focusing on iraq as a hyundai korean company so we are having their uh, 8 into 400 megawatt power plant it is a basically oil fired boiler and uh, siemens make turbine and after that uh, we are making a combined cycle power plant in uh, montreal canada for 160 uh, megawatt and uh, we are more focused on the epc project and all those sites and uh, i would like to share you few of things credentials of our companies uh, we have made a very large refinery and uh, in iraq and we are redeveloping uh, the complete iraq so uh, our investment uh, of company as well as government of iraq uh, it, it is around more than 14 billion dollar so let me share you some slides i hope everybody is looking this yes yes this is the karbala hyundai refinery basically our company is in uh, hyundai is having 92 companies and uh, it is mostly around 230 billion dollar company and uh, we are in ship building and we are in oil and gas sector we are in chemical sector we are in power sector we are very well known in the ship builders every years we are making roughly around 7 to 800 thousand ton uh, ships so this basically uh, recently we are going to commission this project and uh, i am going to show the highlight of the project uh, this is the karbala refinery and uh, this is location it is uh, away from baghdad around uh, 25 km of south karbala city and uh, this is uh, we are using the basra and uh, misri basra is uh, 400 km away from the karbala and you know whole gulf is connected with the complete pipeline of uh, crude oil as well as gas lines so and uh, we are making here a captive power plant also we already made 200 megawatt and uh, this is the our guidelines of uh, refinery project decided in between uh, iraq ministry of oil and uh, hyundai heavy industries so these are the few highlights which i am sharing and uh, i would focus on here main things there is a site location this is actually project owned by state oil company of iraq government this contract value is more than uh, 6 billion dollar already we have completed uh, 90% of our job within uh, this uh, coming march we are going to commission this project and uh, this is our complete plot plan and layout of the this uh, refinery as well as power plant our raw material is crude we are making hfo the heavy gasoline oil low gasoline oil after that uh, we are making the petrol diesel as well as uh, we are making the a uh, few gases also during the process and uh, i'm basically power plant person this is the complete process flow map of the basra crude case how we are making in the kerosene oil diesel bgo uh, fcc polyethylene hpu srs and uh, this is the bitumen also as well we are making during this process you know during during oil refinery process there are uh, various uh, waste product is coming which is useful for us and uh, next thing is that uh, this crude uh, analysis per day how much we are doing the capacity is 140000 and uh, naphtha roughly 41500 we are making these are the all process which you people can see on the screen and uh, unit name what is the capacity raw water roughly 1200 Uh, cubic meter per hour we are using fire water this much this is our plant size and capacity and which kind of product we are generating like lpg gasoline oil atk diesel heavy diesel fuel oil industrial bitumen paving and sulfur even sulfur we are exporting to so many countries and two of the plant is in operation because it, it, it is a roughly around 50 square kilometer area we have acquired from the government to make this plant as apc contractor for ministry of oil state oil company in iraq and uh, this is our complete expense sheet which is i hope it is not necessary to share with the people this is the basic our field design package how much uh, we are doing and what kind of modeling we are doing what is the drying method which 
you people already discussing about now i am not i am uh, not sharing this thing and another thing i am going to share which we are going to do this project we are already in process uh, and to execute th this project this is also belongs from hyundai and uh, this is a power project especially and you know current world nobody is making thermal power plant so we are making with the ministry of electricity this uh, 2800 megawatt net power plant and 10% extra we can add it for auxiliary power consumption so it will be around uh, roughly around 3200 Uh, megawatt we are going to generate eight unit of uh, this uh, um, 400 megawatt unit this is our uh, project and this is the basically belong to hello group and we are having joint venture with them and uh, this is the iraq government is uh, currently making around 35000 megawatt power uh, to far is uh, republic of iraqi people and uh, we are going to contribute this year we are going to kick off this project and next year we are going to uh, an, uh, again kick off around 2800 megawatt of power project so we are roughly making around 6200 megawatt next coming 5 years so i am looking all this project in uh, iraq as well as uh, europe and we are in uh, renewable sector of energy also and uh, we are doing wind power plant solar power plant as well as uh, hydro power plant and uh, we are in nuclear power also so this kind of project we are doing so this is our i would like to introduce myself i have worked in india with vedanta and jindal as well as uh, saporji polanji and uh, i have worked with monet so i have executed more than uh, 9000 megawatt in india power project so these people has called us and now we are making the around the globe our indian people we are making so many projects this is our complete group and our production if you have any question please ask thank you sir for sharing insights anup do you have anything to say yeah yeah anand ji uh, so nice to hear from you that what uh, as indians we are achieving really absolutely great uh and now uh, i mean maybe uh, when ekta uh, connects you again we can discuss further about you know uh, discussing things with you on a uh, asset uh, apm side because uh, many of the companies have really uh, grown out of this so very very interesting sir what you just now shared thank you so much thank you thank you thanks Uh, now i would really like to invite thoughts of mr alok mukherjee here, who is uh, in the expert speaker over to you mr alok and thank you for joining yeah thank you ekta thank you anup and uh, a big thumbs up to uh, mr anand for sharing his experiences uh, of taking uh, uh, i would say taking india abroad uh, you know the way he is taking the power sector projects in uh, outside of india that speaks highly so a big thumbs up to you uh, uh, having said that having said that you know uh, one must also realize uh, the daunting challenges uh, one faces uh, like uh, you know what we have seen what we have heard just now uh, till now you know we were more focused more concerned about power projects in different geographies uh, in different locations in india but now we are you know talking about a sort of one world structure uh, you know uh, taking a cue from uh, what our prime minister had said in the g20 summit you know it's going to be one world one family one future that sort of thing so this is where you know this connectivity becomes so very important uh, it was mentioned uh, in uh, by you know varun uh, in the beginning that you know what has to be whether a company has a connectivity strategy but uh, myself having spent around you know 37 years in the power industry in various companies uh, so i feel now you know this connectivity is not a you know something uh, which has to be decided it is an imperative uh, it is an imperative and also i borrow a 
praise from what Varun, I think, had shown in the end, that these days, you know, there is a talk about climate concerns and also there is a talk about profitability. So, uh, you know, there is sometimes a mistaken belief that it is climate concerns versus profitability, whereas he has very well shown that actually climate concern means profitability. It is, so these are certain things, you know, as coming from the user side, mostly from people who have, uh, you, you know, used these uh, uh, digital transformation process, we have to, you have to be conscious of the fact that, you know, con connectivity is an imperative uh, for business, you know, sustainability. And uh, climate concerns is not a fashion, you know, it, it, it in, in fact generates profit also. So having said that, I'll go a little deeper into each uh, aspect of it. First of all, you know, there is a talk about renewable penetration, uh, for, ostensibly because of climate concerns, but now as we see it's profitable also. Having said that, we also need energy for the growth, especially in developing countries. And uh, right now we have seen that even though there is a tapering down of, uh, you know, uh, thermal power uh, construction, but still there is a big fleet of thermal power already present uh, in, in the world and mostly in developing countries and most notably in India. And uh, there, you know, increasing efficiency is showing concern towards climate. It is also increasing the profitability of a company. And, and these, when I discuss about, you know, the role of digital digitalization in power plants, I say that, you know, these are the low hanging fruits because, you know, once we are monitoring uh, the parameters of a power plant on a real time basis, and it is available to all the stakeholders, then this is one area where we can take immediate action and then we can increase the efficiency of the plant. And I need not emphasize, I need not tell this audience that efficiency means that you burn less coal to generate the same amount of electricity or more electricity. You know, this is what it means. So if by merely, you know, of monitoring the parameters and taking immediate remedial action. If you are, you know, uh, taking improvement, improving the efficiency and thereby burning less coal, you are contributing a lot towards the climate, you know, concerns and also increasing the profitability. So here, this thing plays a very important role. The second part is, you know, when we are talking about heat rate, we, when we are talking about losses in a power plant, we talk about the controllable losses and the non-controllable losses. So when we talk about the non-controllable losses, sometimes our, you know, uh, our estimate and everything, they come from experience. But here, you know, since we are measuring the data, everything is available in a historian, everything can be available through predetermined calculations, which is available to all stakeholders. It is available to the operating team, it is available to the maintenance team, and also to the you know, corporate team. So the, they are all looking at the same set of data, the same set of calculations, which I call the democratization of data. You know, this, this is where, you know, a solution like what is offered by uh, pi, what is offered by Aviva, you know, those, those become so very important. And lastly, I will say, you know, now renewable energy penetration into the grid is becoming very important, where we already have a sizable thermal fleet. So, you know, the thermal fleet operation has to, you know, uh, uh, operate in a different regime than what we had uh, been operating earlier. So here also, you know, availability of data and the uh, sort of, you know, flexibility which has to be there in the operation. So that gets, you know, enhanced by the availability of data over a fleet. 
and that is beside you know whatever we heard from the Aviva team related to you know maintenance, you know helping the maintenance part, moving from preventive maintenance to predictive maintenance. So you know uh, those things are you know uh, very valuable for all of us. So with these advantages and uh, all the insight I, we have heard from the speakers, uh, I'll just hand it over to uh, Anup and Ekta for the next speaker. Thank you so much, Mr. Alok, for sharing your insights. Now, can I quickly invite uh, the thoughts of Mr. Manu Sharma, who is a Deputy General Manager, BSCS with Yamuna Power Limited. Mr. Manu, please share your uh, thoughts on the same. And it's okay if you can keep your video off. That's entirely fine. Thank you. Thank you, Ekta, and thanks to Anu. Uh, am I audible? Yes, you are, Mr. Thank you, thank you. So I'll just quickly share uh, three points. Since I'm from a utility business, so I'll share my uh, thoughts from uh, that perspective. Uh, the first is like uh, Varun and Naveen uh, showed us like some really great insights. So we also did a similar uh, thing in our uh, company a few years back with uh, IIT Daily. We collaborated, and for predictive maintenance, we uh, installed. Uh, uh, equipment across 100 substations. So we had like we have around uh, 3,000 substations, but un unfortunately we couldn't scale it up. So the problem that uh, one of the uh, members in the chat also said that uh, the problem is how do we digitize the existing like legacy equipment that we have. So that one uh, problem area where the scaling part comes in. Like we can't scale if we can properly uh, enable the uh, enable our equipment. Like, how do we obtain data from? We have to install various sensors at various points. So, one of the solutions is like uh, the newer, uh, uh, the newer equipment coming in. So, sensors are uh, uh, are ensuring that they are like a plug-in play. Uh, can you mute the... Uh, 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 yes, yes, yes. Uh, you mute, please. Yes, sir. Please. So sorry, so sorry, Mr. Manu. It's fine, it's fine. Okay. So I, as I was saying that the, uh, like recently the OEMs themselves have in, uh, like they've ensured that any company like Aviva, the people in common that can uh, plug and play their uh, uh, equipment, and they'll be ready for like whatever they want to do with those equipment. So that's a really uh, good uh, like way to ensure that we can scale them to the like maximum limit. The second point I wanted to discuss was like about the tech 4.0. So where we can properly use them is like in, even in the generation and other like distribution and transmission companies. So what we are facing now is in India is that we are quickly scaling up in the renewable sector. So like in the wind, uh, like the wind power plant, so they are already uh, minimum from 100 megawatt to gigawatt capacity plants are there. And in solar, we get, can see that from gigawatt to kilowatt also, like any consumer can also are now can produce uh, solar energy from their own homes. So this is like the next challenge that we have, that how do we predict what would be the upcoming scenario for like various generation and utility companies. So there, the AI and ML can play a very huge role. So we can take the past data or we can even take from like the developed nation, like the European or uh, US country that how do we, how do we uh, face these challenges? We have to be ready for them. If we are not, then we'll, somewhere will be found lacking. So that, that part, I think the, the tech 4.0 will be really useful. The last part I wanted was that, I wanted to say that was the, the VR and the augmented reality portion. Like we can use this technique in training the people. So what we have done here in our company is like we have created a simulate, simulation software but it is basically a 2D model. So what we can now look into the future is like having a 3D model with VR headsets. We can enable people 
for giving them training like on safety and quality components and also like operational and maintenance activities you can train them through this part so these are some of the points that i wanted to discuss <laughs> i had to be quick because or maybe you are getting short of time so i will invite it to mr thank you anyway. thank you uh, mr sharma for sharing your insights so i think anup we are already at 430 at the closure so any final thoughts from your end anup and i can do the closure then uh, uh, uh of course there were many questions that were asked in the chat box and uh, i would say you can uh, send your questions well i'm sure there may be many questions left out also there may be people who wanted to ask but may not have done that being busy also so kindly be free to you know send your questions to ekta or to the uh, to the place from where you received your uh, i mean if you are connected with any one of us through mail uh, we will be able to get back to you on the questions but it was very very heartening to see uh, how uh, the industry is you know uh, uh, this power industry is trying to get into uh, the it way because yes very rightly said it and ot is now uh, uh, the name of the game and uh, the moment ot comes in cyber security enters and uh, we have been uh, uh, really trying to uh protect uh, quite a few uh, people in this we have already done a few of them we will be able to do a few of them uh, through a very very big uh, uh, pioneering technology which is known as waterfall from israel uh, yes uh, we put those uh, solutions also and as ecubix uh, i would just like to say uh, thank you so much uh, visit our site see what all we can do we can do much more than what we can talk in this small <laughs> amount of time and uh, ekta uh, let's meet most of them uh, one on one so that we are able to convey that really what we can do for the industry because uh, we are very excited to talk to you people from our side thank you very much yeah sure anup thank you so of course on the closing note i would like to thank all our speakers mr alexander mr sunil mr rajiv mr anand Mr. Manu, Mr. Alo, Varun, and Mr. Navin Sulangi, Mr. Kamal Deep Sir, and Anu for sharing your insights, making this so 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 interesting. Audiences, thank you so much for making the chat box engaging. In fact, that really helps our partners also to understand the pain points, and that's where they pick it from there. So now, uh, again, on the last note, I would like to thank each one of you for taking out your precious time on Friday evening, and uh, have a lovely weekend, everyone. we shall be sharing the video of the entire session with you and also as mentioned by mr anup we would love to reconnect you with the ecubix team for their wonderful solution that talks about uh, industry 4.0 of the power plant so once again thank you stay safe everyone and have a lovely week weekend thank you ahead. very much Bye. thank you very much for engaging with us thank you so much thank you very much thanks everybody yeah. thank you everyone thank you bye bye